So I had a call with someone last week in um, some, uh, she was somewhere in the east coast of Australia uh, and she's involved with a, a new collective, 16 people that are, um, have you know, similar values. Uh, they want to make the world better. They want to do it without a hierarchy. They're trying to organize in a collective way. Um, and she was asking for some of my experiences from Lumio and from Inspiral. And, and while I was talking with her, I had a whiteboard behind me. And so I started drawing some diagrams to explain some stuff. Um, and by the time I got to the end of the conversation, I had six diagrams and I thought, hey, that, that could be useful. So I've been um, experimenting with sharing these um, circles with people and, and seeing if they have any kind of resonance with, with you. So I'll run through them as quickly as I can and um, we can see if they have any relevance. So the first one, concentric circles. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna ditch the pyramid, you have to choose um, you know, what your shape is. And um, I'm, as you can tell already, quite a fan of circles. Um, my life changed when I started sitting in circles and um, talking and listening with people. And um, you know the thing about a circle where you sit there and you can see everyone else and you can hear everyone else. Circles are pretty important. Um, the concentric circles idea, this is something that we use at Inspiral and at Lumio and I've st started to see it ad adapt to other groups. So uh, this is why I'm interested in it. Um, the big circle is, we call them contributors, and the small circle in the middle is called members. So the idea is that the contributors is a large group of people that are working on some kind of project, they're contributing something, um, but they've got a relatively low uh, degree of stakeholding in, in the project or the company or the whatever it is. Um, whereas the members in the middle, they have a much um, higher degree of context and a higher degree of commitment and therefore a higher degree of stakeholding. So at Inspiral, we have about 200 people in the contributor circle and about 50 people in the member circle. The members are the ones that have the legal shareholding of the Inspiral Foundation. Uh, they're the ones who are responsible, responsible for holding the culture um, and for making emergency decisions if necessary. Whereas the, the wider group, um, that contributor circle, that's where we do as much of our activity as possible. So um, by default, all of our discussions and all of our decisions happen out in the big circle and we only retreat to the small circle um, occasionally if it's necessary on a, on a sort of case-by-case -case basis. And the effect is a, well, essentially a contributor is somebody that one member trusts. A member is somebody that all the members trust. So you've got a very low barrier of entry to the first ring and then a very high barrier of entry to the second ring. And that allows you to balance um, inclusion. So it's easy to get new people in and, and benefit from the enthusiasm from, from you know, new ideas, new contributors. Um, but you don't immediately give all the power to someone that just turned up this week. You have a way of saying, you know, so we use this within Lumio too. The members get to set the budget, but the contributors get to set the plan. So um, everyone that's working as a contributor, and they've all got great insights about what the plan should be, but the members are the ones that have been around for a long time and are committed to stick around for a long time into the future, and so they've got the context about how to set the budget well, and they're gonna have the biggest impact, the budget's gonna have the biggest impact on them because they're um, depending on this thing for their livelihood in a way that the, the contributor circle isn't. So that, that practice of just naming, hey, there's different levels of stakeholding, we've got different names for it, we've got different spaces for it, there's a pathway for you to come in, um, but it's not automatic. That's proved to be really, really resilient, really, um, I think one of the most, it's the reason it's number one, I think it's the most important factor, is naming that level of commitment. Um, the second one, magical spaces. Um, magic is kind of a placeholder word for, I don't know what the word is. Um, uh, <laughs> A magical space to me is a space where something shifts inside, deep inside your core. Um, it's, it's kind of like, some, you, you know, you might have that kind of space with your therapist or with your lover. You might have that space um, at a festival or sitting around a campfire. Um, but it's, a, it's an environment where something very deep inside your core can shift and, and is supported to shift. And the reason that's important is if we are not going to use force to align people, you know, if we're not going to have someone in charge that says this is what we're doing and you can either get on board or get off, 
um, that doesn't really leave you a lot of options <laughs> for aligning people other than people have to change something about themselves. They have to, um, it's, it can be really simple stuff. Some people take up a lot of space. They go as an audio space that they, they take up a lot of space and, and they um, kind of steal space of, of other people. And so the person who takes up a lot of space has got to learn how to step back a few times and, and, and not turn up to every meeting and not um, have the answer to every question. And it, by the same token, the person that's not taking up space has to learn how to you know, gather that confidence and, and start to um, make their voice heard and so on. So we've got lots of different approaches to forming these magical spaces. Uh, one of the key ones that um, is, is pivotal for us is we call it a retreat. It's a, a gathering every six months. Um, in the Lumio context, that's the, the 11 of us go away for a weekend and um, it's primarily about connecting with each other and connecting with our shared vision. You know, we've named what are we here to do um, and we've committed to each other and we let those relationships um, go really, really deep in, in that uh, retreat space, which is, um, I guess, I guess the, the, the rationale is we're trying to invent a new culture. Well, maybe it's an old culture that we're trying to um, rescue, but we're trying, to, we're trying to establish a culture that is in opposition to the mainstream culture. Or if it's not in opposition, at least it can be threatened by the mainstream culture. So, for instance, um, you know, the culture that I live in has a huge emphasis on money. It has um, a really unfair distribution of power um, based on things like your gender or your ethnicity or your physical abilities. Um, and we want to establish a culture that is not like that. You know that that um, where we share power e equally with people, uh, regardless of of what genitals they have or what color their skin is, um, and and that requires us retreating occasionally to to invest very deeply in that. Um, and it's in those spaces really that we get to invent a lot of the the cultural norms um, that set us apart from the mainstream culture. So those spaces are really pivotal. The third one, this one uh, is another one that I've seen um, spreading into other groups, which makes me feel like it's a good one. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer accountability. And whenever I say accountability, I'm actually thinking about support. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to get into a managerial mindset and think about accountability as in, um, why didn't you do that thing you said you were going to do? Whereas the support way of thinking that, about that might be, you know, how can I support you to do that thing you said you were going to do? <laughs> Which is a completely different um, way of asking the question and has completely different results. So maybe this slide should be renamed peer-to-peer -peer support. But the idea with this is, um, with that circle, is in both within Lumio and in Inspiral, we call it stewards. In other groups, we call it other things, but in our groups, we call it stewards. And the idea of a steward is a steward is someone who has a special relationship with you. It's a bit like a coach. It's a bit like a mentor. Um, but it's more your peers, your, your, your equal peers. But there is some directionality. The steward is looking after the stewardy. Um, and so what that looks like in practice at Lumio, I said there's 11 of us uh, members of the co-op. Um, I get to steward Alana. Alana gets to steward Matt, Matt gets to steward MJ, MJ gets to steward James, and it goes around in the circle. So we're distributing the load of, of support and the load of care. And, and roughly that means we catch up with each other once a month and go, you know, how's it going? What do you need? How can I, um, you know, how's your relationship with the group? Is there something that the group could do differently that would help your participation? All these sorts of questions. Um, so it's like, it's, yeah, like a bit like a, having a mentor, but more like a buddy. It's like this emerging um, definition. We're not quite sure what it is, but um, each pair, the steward and steward e pair, we negotiate together the terms of that. You know, what are we up for? Do we want to have a call every month or um, maybe every three months is fine? Or um, do we even want a call? Maybe we want to have like, uh, I've got with, um, my steward has got a, a special emoji that he sends me when he thinks that I'm getting a bit stressed out and it's like a little code. And say, okay, no one else is going to have that. That's just a, um, a thing that we've negotiated together where I've got this, this buddy that has extra context about me and, and um, 
can help me to be at my best. And in the Lumio context, we use that um, that steward role really um, really shines when there's a conflict. So if I have an issue with somebody that I feel like I, I can't for whatever reason, I can't just go directly to them, I'll call in my steward or I might call in their steward and say, can you host a conversation between the two of us because we've got some tension that needs to be worked through. And having that third party there that has some you know extra context about me makes me feel safe and puts me in a position where I'm ready to communicate in an adult way uh, and, and can break up a, a bad dynamic that would be perpetuated if it was just the two of us conflicting parties going at each other. So that um, that stewardship ring has has really got profound value and we intentionally set up the relationships so that people who wouldn't otherwise get to know each other have a, have a, an excuse to, to build a relationship. So um, because everyone's having a go rather than just having a, a manager or an HR person that looks after people, um, you've got this whole diversity of approaches and everyone gets to learn from each other's way of, of doing support. Rhythm, 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 rhythm. This for me, uh, I, I say it over and over again because it's, it just seems to be always the answer to any question. <laughs> um, how do you navigate through emergent space where everything changes every five minutes but still have some kind of shared understanding and of where we're going? Um, how do you maintain that flexibility to adapt to a changing environment um, but not change so fast that nobody is on the same page anymore? And, and we've... Um, installed a whole stack of rhythms within Lumio that help us uh, navigate through that emergence in a way that is coherent. So um, we've got the daily rhythm. So every morning, 10 o'clock on the dot, we have a stand up. Anyone that's working that day, they'll join in, whether in person or remotely, and they'll say, this is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm doing today. These are the obstacles that I have and need support with. And this new one that we've added, um, this is what I'm going to do for my well-being today. So it's a way of us paying attention to how people feel. And um, so in that you might get, I'm, um, I went to the gym this morning and it's helped me feel really onto it and it's lowered my stress or could be all sorts of things. So we're, we're sharing tips and tricks for um, being well. Um, so that's the, the, the daily rhythm. And so in that space, which takes 10 or 15 minutes, um, you do all these mi micro adjustments, you know, so um, today I'm working on this poster, but I'm blocked because I haven't got the statistics for that particular chart. And the other person will be like, oh, well, I can do that. I'll get you those, those numbers first thing, you know, so you just got that, that little adjustment. But you're not doing, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate to come to stand up and say, oh, I think we should throw out the plan and do something completely different. Like that's, that's not the space for it. The, the daily space is just we make little, little tiny tweaks. Then we have another rhythm which happens at the, the fortnight, at the two weekly scale. And that's where we go, um, yeah, what is the, we stop and reflect and we go, how was the last two weeks? What was good? What was bad? What are we going to do differently next time? And then we look forward to the next two weeks and we go, what are we committing to delivering? Um, and so in that space, you can make slightly larger adjustments. So you, you bring in, um, I think it's time to put that idea to bed and start working on this one. Then beyond that, we've got the, the quarterly rhythm. So every three months we go away together for a day and we set some objectives. So I've just come out of that process. Um, last week we set um, across our team of 11 people, we set five objectives, which I think is too many. I prefer to have three. But the idea with the, with the agreed objectives is somehow all of the different things that you're doing, because we do prioritize autonomy and freedom, somehow all of those things that you're working on add up to these three measurable, specific, deliverable objectives. So that could be, I'm gonna um, raise the number of people using Lumio by a factor of 10, or I'm going to increase the rate at which these people, you know, the speed at which these people activate from first hearing about Lumio to, to really understanding how it works and getting a lot of value out of it. Um, so those objectives are really key. And once again, at that quarterly space, you can bring in more radical ideas. And at that um, quarterly meeting, that's where we will name what our our um, working groups. So um, we've just 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 before I got on this call, we finished naming. We've got eleven working groups for this quarter, and then you know, so one is about marketing. One of them is about um, 
content development. One of them is about the board. You know, there's all these different groups and people get to um, self-select into the ones that are most aligned with their passions and they all add up to this is the plan that we're trying to deliver. So at that three, three monthly space, you make much more significant shifts than you would at the day-to-day -day space. Um, and then beyond that, we look out at three years. And so we have a, um, uh, we, we just call that strategy, the three-year horizon. And we have a, a strategy meeting roughly every month or so. For some reason, we do it very early in the morning because it seems to put people in a different frame of mind. And we'll have a topic. Um, so maybe it's about the software. Okay, well, what is the software going to look like in three, in three years? And we just tell a story together. We don't make decisions about what the strategy is going to be, but we intentionally go into that space and talk about some plausible futures for that topic three years in the future. And so that means that all of us are operating with a, a, a relatively similar view of the options that are up there on our distant horizon. And as we approach them, as we get closer, you know, on that, on that um, three monthly rhythm, we get closer and closer. We can, we've got shared language to say, ah, okay, we're heading towards um, this landmark rather than that, that landmark. And we've, we've gathered our shared language around what those landmarks are in that strategy space. The fifth one, this is where the software comes in, I guess, for us, um, but doesn't have to be software, is just the basic thing of making decisions. Um, it's, it's one of the critical factors of success for a group is whether or not they explicitly make decisions. If they're not explicitly making decisions, then probably what you've got happening is a really informal power structure, and maybe that's healthy, but more likely it's not. And um, whereas if you are explicitly making decisions where you have someone say, I think we should do this, can I get a show of hands or um, can I get a Lumio vote or whatever other system you might want to use? Um, if you are making decisions together, then then you are actually sharing power. Then you are going on together and, and um, you are getting the benefits of the collective intelligence. Um, and, and for us, um, that's all about, yeah, collective intelligence, about... Um, I think we should do this. What do you think about it? Well, what I think about is I've got this problem and this problem. And if you look at those problems, you can reframe them into a positive and, and refine the quality of the idea and improve it. And at the end of it, you get, we should do this rather than I should do this. Um, which is a, you know, takes a long time for a, for a, a new person to shift from, from an I to a we, but it's pretty profound when that happens. Um, the sixth and final circle that I wanted to share, um, this was, as, like I said, I was on the phone to this uh, person in, in the east coast of Aussie, and she said, yeah, this is all cool and stuff, but what about when you have someone that's just a jerk? You know, how do you organize, how do you accommodate for the fact that some people are just, uh, they've got a different set of values or they've got some kind of trauma that they're working through or whatever's going on, but that really... Um, prevents them from participating in a healthy way. And that to me is all about boundaries. So um, having some collectively decided, that's the previous step, having a decision about what are we up for? Like what is an appropriate way to communicate? What kind of behavior is appropriate here and what's not? And what we found was going through that process to develop our definition of what those boundaries are, that's super, super valuable just in itself, that process of, of saying I'm up for this and I'm not up for that. Um, and we almost never have to use it. We never, you know, almost never have to have to um, say, look, you've crossed the boundary, you're out. But just knowing that together we have decided what we're up for really um, helps to shape people's behavior in a really constructive way without, um, without being coercive. You know, it's something that people opt into. Say, I'm up for um, leaving my racism and sexism at the door. You know, I'm not going to bring that here. Um, and if we do have someone come in and, and, and exhibits a bunch of racism and sexism, we can say, look, uh, within this space, it's not appropriate, you know, by joining, you agree that you're not going to do that here. So um, you can take that behavior elsewhere. Um, and, and that, um, I guess the lesson for me in this is, is that community is actually defined by its boundaries. You know, we all want to be inclusive. Uh, we want to, this is one of the things that we found to occupy. You know, we, we died by being too inclusive. We, we wanted to be 100% inclusive. But unfortunately, you start including people whose behavior excludes others. So there's no such thing as 100% inclusive. So you, then you have to decide, well, what are we including? What are we up for? 
So I know I've probably gone over time, but those were the things that I wanted to share. These are some websites that have some information that you can, you know, follow up in your own time, but um, we should really stop listening to me and uh, hear what's, on the, what's going on in the rest of the room.